Hi, I'm Eleanor Meyerhofer, a native Californian, designer, and digital strategist. In October of 1999, a few years after graduating from design school, I flew from San Francisco to Munich with a fistful of Deutschmarks, a dial-up connection, and an extremely vague plan. 20 plus years later, after a 10-year stint at a global agency, freelancing, and launching two online businesses, I'm still here. Now I'm talking to other expat business owners to share knowledge, stories, and inspiration for other non-Germans running businesses in Germany. Today, I am here with Laura Ung of Hungry Tea Masters. And I am trying to think about where I first discovered you. I think it was actually LinkedIn. And then um, I, I think I profiled you in my Munich Christmas guide on the blog because you guys have interesting products that people would like. And then I recently went to one of your um, tea tastings, but I'll stop there. <laughs> and um, I'm going to start with the question I ask everybody, which is the two minute version where you tell us who you are and how you ended up in Germany. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Ung. Um, I am a multi-hatter, so I have a full-time job as a performance marketing manager. I started my own business as a tea sommelier where I do tea and food pairing to introduce the concept of tea to everyone in Europe. And then um, I also started a Southeast Asian Entrepreneurs in Europe Association to help Southeast Asian entrepreneurs to set their foot here in Germany and Europe. And uh, how I ended up in Germany, it's to actually get out of the box. I'm a born and bred Singaporean who spent the first 20 plus years of my life in Singapore, trying to tick all the boxes that society has in place for us. Um, for example, getting good results, getting to good school, getting into one of the three public universities in Singapore, and then getting married, um, having children, and life stops there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that was not what I wanted so when my then boyfriend told me he had to move to Munich for two years as part of his doctoral program I said yes in a heartbeat I did mm -hmm. not have any plans I just pack up, got married packed up my bag and went with him with just an A1 German language certificate I had no plans I thought things would just pan out but um, life is full of surprises <laughs> So what, what happened? So you, you had a one German and you guys came directly to Munich. Yes. We, we came directly to Munich to study, um, for him to study. I was looking for a job and then I decided to take up a master's mm -hmm. before we moved to Dresden for six years, um, after his studies, uh, because at that point in time, it's really hard to find, um, a job in Munich back in 2000. 16. Okay, so you've been here, you've been here like seven years then? I've been here for nine years. Nine years, okay. Okay, it was hard to find a job. Yeah, um, back in 2016, it was really hard if you um, did not have fluent German. Oh. And lack of work experiences. Um, that I, I went for certain interviews, my husband went for certain interviews and they just asked like, do you speak German? And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, not so um, fluent. And it's like, I'm sorry, we don't have an opening for you. Okay. Yeah, I th sometimes I think that might be easier in Berlin because I feel like nobody there speaks German. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> has a job if they want it. Well, that's not true. But, um, and I know I lucked out because I was, I started at an American company that was here in Germany and the recruiter was from Boston. And when he asked me how good my German was, I said, it's not really very good. And he just said, ah, it doesn't matter. But that was like dumb luck. So yeah, and I think Bavaria does tend to be a little more German and conservative that way. But okay, so you um, you were looking for a job. Then what happened? Because you obviously did get a job at some point. Yes, um, I got a job after my master's, which I was really thankful for. But um, the, bar the language barrier always existed or it, it mm -hmm. still exists so at a certain point in time I did not get my opportunity in to take part in certain projects mm -hmm. um, or certain discussions or even lunch jokes like I mm -hmm. can't participate 
and uh, that created a barrier. And at certain point in time, I felt burned out. Yeah. Like, um, uh, it's, it was quite tiring to feel, or to make myself feel included. Uh, it, it sometimes in sometimes it feels like um I'm the only one making the effort to fit in, mm-hmm. while the my colleagues are are just um being themselves. Like there was no effort from their end to include me. Mm-hmm. So um during so I switched job um after two years in my first company and in my second company um the team leader was someone I would never want to work with anymore. Mm-hmm. Like she was mm-hmm. a micromanager. Like she literally, literally just peer over my shoulder to oh my look God. at what I was looking <laughs> at. Like yeah. And so um, that was in 2020, early 2020. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought, you know what, maybe I should take a break. Mm-hmm. Um, I left the job and I decided to pursue um, something else. So that's where the tea sommelier idea came about. So okay. that's where, I, yeah. Um, wait, let me also back up. What industry were you working in? Um, so I was first a consultant uh, mm-hmm. for data-driven marketing. Mm-hmm. And then um, I became a consultant for marketing and business development. Mm-hmm. And um, now I'm a performance marketing manager. So after a break. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But these were obviously German companies. Yes. Yeah. I've never had a chance to work international company. See, I think that can make a huge difference because like I said, the company that I started out was American, but it was, even though it was an established company in the States, they were kind of like a startup here. And so pe- it was a totally international environment. And then I was sent to other because I, a native English speaker, I was sent always on international projects. But once, once I was at telecom and it was so awful. I was okay. like, get me out of here. And it was that like very kind of conservative journey. And I think if you're stuck in that, it is very demotivating. I mean, mm-hmm. to be fair, we're in Germany or whatever, but I can... I think, yeah, if that's your entry point into the labor market in Germany, then it, and you're not like super fluent in German, it can be, can be hard. Um, okay. But so, so that's where you said, let's take a break here. And were you already a tea sommelier? Uh, so no, I, that's w- when I say I took a break, I decided to sign myself up, um, to be certified as a tea masters mm-hmm. before being a tea sommelier um, and that took or lasted um, around two years so, um, COVID helped with that because I could do everything <laughs> virtually <laughs> and, um, yeah so but halfway through my um, training so it, it, the whole training was two years right so like mm-hmm. uh after one year, we decided to officially set up our business and um, just try all this concept out before deciding what our actual product. Because it's really hard to find a real product, mm-hmm. or a product that is um, widely accepted in the market until you actually try it, like yeah. various version of it. Did you, well, first, okay, first question, what's the difference between a tea master and a tea sommelier? So a tea master is someone who is really fluent um, in tea and like they're, they're really knowledgeable. They try all different types of teas. Um, they can do tea appreciation with you mm-hmm. um, and they can conduct tea classes. Mm-hmm. But tea sommelier is someone who, on top of being a tea master, mm-hmm. knows the taste, the fragrance of tea and how you can pair the tea with food or you how, how you could even... Um, cook tea Mm -hmm. as of a dish Mm -hmm. or even um, pair tea with a certain type of weather or event yeah weather weather yeah so so for example i get that intuitively but explain yeah so for example there there are some teas that are more suited for summer Mm -hmm. some teas more suited for winter 
um, like you wouldn't want to drink a really strong black tea in the middle of the day during summer. No. Yeah, yeah you will be sweating <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I want to hear about this product experimentation. So what were some of your early ideas and how did you test them out? Um, so our initial, it, it was a really crazy journey. So at first we wanted to just um, sell exotic teas, like from Myanmar, from uh, places you have never heard of. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, there's a reason why you have never heard of such teas. Because firstly, they do not export. They have political issues. They have social issues that uh, prevent them from selling their teas out mm -hmm. or exporting their teas. So uh, we were being overly ambitious in the sense we thought we could enter, the, uh, like we could get the product from the market and quickly sell it into Europe. Okay. Um, it was not as easy because the um, certain countries lack um, the testing for the tea. They mm -hmm. lack the pesticides pesticide control oh. for example which we weren't even aware of um, until we really got their product and we sent them for testing wait you sent it somewhere in germany for testing yes okay this is this is where i think it would be really difficult to do an import business so is that something you have to do like with any food stuff that um, you import Yes, ideally you should do it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, for the sake of consumers and uh, for the sake of uh, your own business and reputation. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some gray areas and, um, you know, being in Germany, sometimes there's miscommunication between the two institutions or various institutions. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there were cases where we went for testing and uh, we had the results and we, we, we tried to highlight it to certain institutions and it's just say, it's niche my problem. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, and, 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 and actually, um, sometimes even when you test, you do not know where's the hard line of yes and no. So like, what would you test? Like, where do you send it to the tooth? Like where would you get some tea, let's say from a country that needs to be tested, then you send it where, to which arm? Um, so so the, that's the thing, you do not send <laughs> it to any arm. You have to find your own um, clinical laboratory ah. um, to test it. Uh -huh. And then um, you have to send the results to um, the hygiene arm, I think, um, if I'm not wrong, I, yeah, um, for them to look through. But if, mm -hmm. if they are interested, if they're not interested, they would just say um, everything looks okay. Okay. <laughs> so you've got to find a lab. And then what do you test for? Just like you just say, test this for pesticides, please. So that's the thing, what should we test for? So um, there were a lot of variations. And so we just had to guess mm -hmm. based on what we read online from the arm, mm -hmm. from everything. Mm -hmm. And we choose what seems to be important, mm -hmm. um, like the lead content, uh, pesticides. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, you could, in theory, so say you like throw up an online store, you want to sell teas. If you were less ethical people you could just say like eh, i'm sure it's fine and sell it but the risk sure. is you could get in trouble like germany doesn't say you can't do that and we're going to control you you just would have to see if something bad happened it's kind of like this although that's not what they write online but mm -hmm. uh, that's what we experience okay so yeah. what, what like did you have a bad experience um we did not thankfully but um, as I mentioned, like actually nobody is actually um, monitoring it. Yeah. It's, it's up to your own integrity. And we have seen uh, tea vendors, certain tea vendors, they do not even change our packaging and all that, which actually um, is not really approved in Germany. Mm -hmm. Like in Germany, you have to have certain um, food safety packaging, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, certain tea suppliers or uh, tea vendors here, they don't even do it. So, so just an example. So it, it's really up to individual and their interpretation on how they should do it right. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> um, okay, so 
but then so because of all this you said we're not going to sell imported teas what was or, or maybe you did what were some of the other ideas or did you go further down that yeah road? yeah so um the next one we went for was um getting teas that are already in europe mm -hmm. because we know it's safe mm -hmm. um but here comes the other issue so teas that ma managed to find their way through into Europe are mostly brought in by Europeans. Mm -hmm. um, certain Europeans know their teas, certain mm -hmm. Europeans don't. And when they don't, uh, the quality of the tea are really bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that brings us to the second problem where we have to try so much or go through so many versions of tea to know uh, which vendor has the best teas, mm -hmm. which vendor um, doesn't really know their teas, or mm -hmm. which vendor um, doesn't even take care of, of their teas. Because um, tea is really absorbent for all types of flavors. Like, for example, if you put a tea close to somewhere where you keep, where you cook onion and garlic, soon enough, your tea will start smelling like onion and garlic. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so so there are certain vendors who do not um really package their tea well or they sell a lot of blended teas in their shop and sometimes even the purest tea like um black tea, green tea starts to smell like blended teas. Or okay. um yeah. Okay. So then so then what was the next idea? And so the next idea we went on was um just to do tea and food pairing with good teas we can find because um good tea usually comes in limited quantities mm -hmm. and uh, we really want to share the joy of um these good teas with people so and we thought of the concept of having events where we could share um the tasting of this tea the mm -hmm. story behind the tea and then um after that share the concept of tea and food pairing to make things more interesting because tea is not just tea it can go with food it changes your palate it changes the flavor of the food that you are eating so um that brought us to where we are mm -hmm. and uh, we realized that that's one of the ideas that uh, actually worked Pre previously of course um with the concept of tea and food pairing, we thought, hey, it's a great idea. Maybe we should come up with uh, tea and food pairing gift packages mm -hmm. for people. Uh, but it's, it turns out to be too pricey and people um, are not that interested. Or it, it's not as attractive as a wine and food package. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'd imagine the shipping is much less expensive. Yes. <laughs> it's not those heavy bottles. <laughs> but so then that means, do I understand right? In essence, that is your core business model is basically events? Yes. So it's basically events because we realize um, for tea appreciation, it's more of a physical experience. Mm -hmm. like doing virtual events or... Um, having a lecture is not as enticing as being able to experience the beauty of tea yourself. Okay. And, yeah. So you, you know where these good teas are. I full disclosure, I went to one of your events. It was very enlightening and very delicious. Um, <laughs> so you get your good teas and then host the events. Um, so obviously these are all local. Yes, um, they are locals, but sometimes we do do um, non-local events upon invitation mm -hmm. or upon request. So, um, for example, in August, coming August, we will be doing a virtual event mm -hmm. um, to reach a wider audience with our partner. Okay. And who, who is like your target market? So our target market would be people who are interested in TT lovers. Mm -hmm. And also people who wish to learn more about tea. Mm -hmm. And we realized um, our third or newest market would be people who are moving away from alcohol. Oh, interesting. How, how yes. did you find that out? Yeah, because um, we have been talking to people and, and somebody 
most of the people um or like some of them would say actually that's a really good idea because sometimes um during events they only have either sparkling water mm-hmm. um carbonated drinks and alcohol mm-hmm. there's nothing else there's ne- there's no tea um there's only coffee and tea could be a good alternative because uh, alcohol is not for everybody and some mm-hmm. of them would like to stay sober especially during networking event mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah and also we realized um there are certain people uh, because of their religion they can drink alcohol mm-hmm. and um i mean a good tea a good sweet tea would be a good alternative for them during events and during okay. meals okay and so you have a marketing background are you are you using that for hungry tea masters oh. <laughs> is it totally different well i do try but sometimes i'm so exhausted from work that i stop thinking um <laughs> so i because this is kind of like my passion project so i try my best not to think too much when i do my social media posts mm-hmm. and all that of course i i wouldn't um overstep certain no go regions in marketing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I, I wouldn't post on certain days, or I wouldn't overpost that so much that it cannibalize each other, like the mm-hmm. post. But mm-hmm. other than that, I try my best not to think too much into posting when managing my own marketing event. Okay, so most of okay. So to also just clarify, right now this is a side hustle. Yes, and I I don't know if you want to go into this, and we can take it out if you want me to. Um, do you want it to stay a side hustle or do you want to just see where it goes or do you have big ambitions for it? Well, um, I will see how it goes because, I mean, life is so unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you never know um, when something will take off. Mm-hmm. And, and I am a greedy person like I want everything to go well I want my my professional career to go well I want my side hustle to go well I I would just wait it out and see which passion brings me further okay but so for now you're and when you say you're marketing it sounds like most of it is social media is that right uh it's part of it I, Yes and no. For um, Hungry Tea Masters, mostly all the marketing are on social media. Mm-hmm. But for my full-time job, I do more than social media marketing. No, I meant for Hungry yeah. Tea Masters. Okay. So, like, yeah. what channel or channels on social media do you use for Hungry Tea Masters? So, for Hungry Tea Masters, we use mostly Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, Facebook, we have an account there, but I would say... I don't know if you realized that there are a lot of angry people on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even, I never go onto my private feed anymore. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's like I'm always on yeah. Hungry Tea Masters Facebook yeah. and um, I, I stopped going to Facebook because the vibe is somewhat off, but mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to lose um, the traction there. So sometimes I just post and I just ignore the comments. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, are see- your comments people get mad about tea? Are you telling me? <laughs> you no, people, people get mad about language. So um, because I type mostly in English, I, uh-huh. I could type in German, but uh-huh. I want to have a wider reach. Like I don't only want to target German, German. Okay. There are a lot of international people here in Germany as well. Uh-huh. So I usually t- type my posts in um, English and sometimes we receive negative comments like, I'm a German and I, I'm looking, I'm seeing your post, all your posts is appearing on my feed and I had told, or like, I can't understand anything or any word that you're typing. Do you gently point them to the C translation thing? <laughs> that that must be on Facebook too. You know how yeah, you I, translate comments? I don't know. I, I think they're just yeah. trolls and then yeah. I just delete their comment. Like I, I yeah. don't even bother. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so, but, um, so most of it would be on Instagram, sometimes mm-hmm. Facebook. And uh, maybe if we have professional events, 
or like we are part of professional events that we'll post it on LinkedIn. Okay. Okay. And I, I feel like I saw your thing on Eventbrite just like, cause you know how that I'm sort of realizing that's a little bit of an, if you want, if you're looking for live events, it does feed you other things happening locally. Um, and that, I mean, I just thought, I was like, oh, that looks good. I'll go. And that's how I, I had heard of you guys, but that's, I think where I saw it and booked. Okay. Yeah. So we initially only put our events on our website and then we realized that what if our event, if our website doesn't get any reach, our event mm-hmm. wouldn't get any reach. That's why we also use plop ourselves into events, right? Mm-hmm. And hopefully someone somehow gets the algorithm and the recommendation yeah. of our event. Ah, there's another one uh, platform that I use. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called Naban An. You know, every you're like, okay, I'm going to finally just get on Naban On. You're like the fifth person in the last two weeks that has told me about Naban On. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so um, initially I had my doubts because um, Naban An, you, you know, it's a full It's your German- neighbor's. Right? Yes, it's your neighbors. Um, yeah. And I had issues registering because of my surname. It's just two alphabet. Uh-huh. And um, it took me three years to get an account there. Because of that? that? Yes, to oh, prove no. that I'm an actual human being. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, it, it's it's really good uh, platform. It's free. Mm-hmm. It allows you to post um, all your events without getting censored uh, by certain groups or okay. anything. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether you have your experiences because in Facebook, certain groups you can't advertise and you post and you get censored. And um, for Facebook and Instagram, you have to pay for your ads. But for Neighbor and Aunt, it's just user-friendly. You just post your event. They even send reminder on behalf of you for mm-hmm. your event. And uh, people are able to comment. Um, you can choose whether you want to advertise within the area you are living in or uh, the whole Germany, for example. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought it was strictly just your neighborhood. No, no. Oh, so, that's interesting. Yes. I will like that. I, I thought about going, we have a dog. And so I was like, oh, you know, I should go on that so we can like find dog walkers more easily. But I guess why did I did then I also was worried, like, I don't know if I want to know everybody in my neighborhood and then like have to say hello on the street. <laughs> but I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I felt the same. Um, but it was so cool because I also have a dog and sometimes mm-hmm. I see um, certain dog walking groups for my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still considering it, whether I should join because I mm-hmm. um, I mean, it's nice for my dog to have companion, for example. Mm-hmm. But if my dog misbehave, he will be notorious throughout the whole neighborhood. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so yeah, there's a pros and cons, I guess. <laughs> right, right. But that's been a good, a good platform for getting the word out about your events. Yes. Okay. Um, so have there been any, I mean, we sort of talked about challenges and lessons learned with the, with the um, testing and importing and all that kind of thing. But what is, is there something you really wish you knew before you started? Um, one would be market research. <laughs> we, we, we were really, really overconfident. Um, when I say we, it's me and my co-founder, founder, my husband. Mm-hmm. We, we just went straight register our business. Uh, we just thought we knew the market. Um, but we realized that actually Europeans or at least Germans mm-hmm. um, have no interest or in tea. Or mm-hmm. even if they're interested in tea, it's just black, mm-hmm. green, blended herbal teas. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, they have no clue. Um, mm-hmm. So that's a costly mistake. Um, the second one would be an extra support system because uh, mm-hmm. when we first set up our business, we were alone. We didn't know who to approach. So we went to a business consultant, which um, yes, that's the story that I shared with you before. So we approached a business consultant to help set up our business. Mm-hmm. Um, but he kind of hook-winked us into applying for grants without fully offering the business consulting 
consultancy services that we needed. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so we just applied for grants, I think uh, twice. Mm-hmm. And that was a total of 8,000 euros. It's a lot. If you mm-hmm. think about starting out for business, uh, I, we could have used the money for a lot of things. Um, but we didn't get any money. We mm-hmm. didn't get any consulting mm-hmm. services. We didn't get any help from marketing. We, we only got a really short business market research for our business um, after a few talks, and that's it. Wait, so you paid this person 8,000 euros? No, I or... didn't. So so the person okay. applied for the grant, and he paid himself using the grant. <laughs> that sounds like a big scam. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All um, right, so yeah, lesson number two, watch out for shady business uh, business consultants. Exactly. And, and if, if they say um, they can help you apply for grants and all that, check and make sure it's within the contract <laughs> that they would actually use the fund to help you or at least you will get certain funds to run your business. So actually, let me that you mentioned earlier, and I think I've seen this a support group. You are are you a founding member of the Munich chapter? You're part of you called it the Southeast Asian Business community what what what's the organization yes yeah, so it's called southeast asian entrepreneurs in europe association okay um i set it up together with my husband because mm-hmm. uh and also another co-founder because of this experience yeah we really want to help um all entrepreneurs to mm-hmm. prevent this step uh, but mm-hmm. it's too wide an audience so we decided to just target or help at least first uh the southeast asian Mm-hmm. Uh, the region where we are from, um, we mm-hmm. are from Singapore, so that's why we decided to first help the Southeast Asian entrepreneurs whenever mm-hmm. and wherever we can by setting up this platform and network where we have um, experienced entrepreneurs who have already set up their businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're also working with incubators and accelerators so that um, they can at least have a recommendation from us to join their program should they wish to join the programs mm-hmm. here in Europe. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the future, we would like to have mentor mentees um, programs to help them. Okay, tell me, I'm curious about this. So how did you find, so you set this up and did you need any special papers or anything to set up this group? So currently it's mm-hmm. unofficial, uh, but we are in our you know, we are on our way to registering it as a Verein, so a non-profit so organ. Yeah, yeah. AFAL here in Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a pretty long process. I mean, yeah. typical of... <laughs> yeah, of course it is. Of course. <laughs> follow all 375 steps, but once you're done, it'll... Yes. <laughs> yes it, it's taking a while, but um, so now we are on our steps of um, doing some paperwork, um, doing the regulations for our organizations Mm -hmm. having our first meeting where we have this voting Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before we could register ourselves at a notary here in germany yeah and how did you find um so you said you have like experienced uh entrepreneurs on the group so how did you find these people and and get them to be part of the group so if um at first it's through word of mouth um Mm -hmm. through people we know Mm-hmm. Um, and then we managed to get certain organizations to help us spread our mm-hmm. reach to a wider audience. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, so that's how we get to know more people. And sometimes we approach certain organizations to ask them whether they are they have members or people they know who are interested to join us, either, mm-hmm. either as members or either as a committee member or volunteer to help out. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm omnipresent sometimes in certain um, Facebook group, LinkedIn group, uh, where people need help, and then I refer them to this organization. Mm-hmm. I attend events as well. Mm-hmm. Events is really important to yeah. show your presence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
I'm so happy COVID's over. I'm yes. having fun going out. So a couple of questions there. Um, so I am part of like some American business groups mm -hmm. and, but there's like many, many people that are not American in them. Is that the same for your organization? Do you have to be a Southeast Asian entrepreneur or is, is it open to other people, but that's like the focus of who you serve first? So um, our focus is mainly Southeast Asian entrepreneurs, but we do not exclude Southeast Asian entrepreneurs and friends. Mm -hmm. And friends meaning uh, people who are interested in South the Southeast Asian region mm -hmm. or um, non-Southeast Asian entrepreneurs who are based in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and wish to look into the European market. Okay, so that's the focus. Yes. I do find, okay, this is a weird question, but, you know, being... Uh, expat Auslander in Germany, it is natural and normal that you kind of find your affinity groups. And I noticed like there are a lot of groups for people from the Spanish speaking region, whether it's Spain or South and Central America. And of course, like UK, English, Canadian, Australian people kind of have their groups because language is so central. So in your case, I mean, Southeast Asia is a bunch of different countries with different languages. So is it English? Like what, how do you, what's the common language? So I would say English uh, okay. because yeah, the, the, there's too many languages yeah. Yeah. within the region. Okay. So that's just how you operate. Yes. And is it all, is it really a, across South, a Southeast Asian countries or is it like a, is it like really it's like 90% Singaporean? <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good question um so currently we have 80 percent singaporean because okay. that's where we started out yeah, uh, but we are now reaching out to more southeast asian uh, entrepreneurs by working with more southeast asian um, institutions other than mm -hmm. the institutions from singapore mm -hmm. yeah we're currently in talks with malaysia thailand etc etc okay cool and i guess that i would assume that's been very helpful like in terms of just having community and sharing knowledge and all that kind of thing. Yes. Um, so it has been really helpful and encouraging to see so many aspiring entrepreneurs or established entrepreneurs and it's heartening to see um, them saying yes, because it's like, mm -hmm. yes, finally there's someone, um, there's a support system. Yes. I want mm -hmm. to help. Yes. I want mm -hmm. to meet more uh, fellow entrepreneurs from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of strange, but although we are all from different country, but when you mentioned you're from Southeast Asia, there's this familiarity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it, can, it's nice. Being like a foreigner in another country from the same place is kind of an immediate bonding experience. Even if maybe you wouldn't necessarily get along at home. Uh, yes. somehow being together in a different place is, is, is good. I think these why, that's why those groups can be so, so powerful. Exactly. Um, yeah, talking about like we wouldn't even meet or something. Like sometimes um, we, we just say like we wouldn't even be friends if we were back home. But mm -hmm. right here out, here, out there in a foreign land, we are all friends with a common experience that we share. Yeah. Speaking of also Germany, I do want to follow up on one point. You had told me that you, I've never been to Dresden, but that you found life in Dresden a little easier than in Munich. Can you tell me why that was? Um, sure, because I think there's a common misconception or um, rather th th there's certain propaganda going on in the mainstream media about how bad the East Germany is like I'm a believer of that propaganda. So, so <laughs> tell me what it's really like. <laughs> yeah, so um, actually, the people there are really welcoming. Mm -hmm. They are really homely, and um, they are down to earth. Mm. Um, so, like people you meet on the streets, people you uh, people at the, working at the bakery. Once they remember you, they will say hi. Mm -hmm. um, it, it feels like a big village by itself mm -hmm. so um it's so nice in the sense like for example i 
used to live in a building uh, with a lot of apartments. And then uh, we even have a WhatsApp group among our neighbors to share tips. We had our neighbors um, fixing the main door for everyone because mm-hmm. it was not working and the housemeister was not around. They really took their toolbox down to mm-hmm. fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, we help each other take care of our pets, our plants when we are on holidays. It, it, it's this kind of openness that um, at least I'm still not experiencing it in Munich. Yeah, I mean, I think Bavaria and Munich is also a little special. I remember when I first moved here, I mean, you're just getting used to everything and everything. You just look at this lens through like, this is Germany and this is all German people. And it's hard to kind of separate those regional differences out. Mm -hmm. And then I worked on a project in Cologne. And then I was like, oh, it's the Bavarian people (laughs) that are just super grouchy. (laughs) And then I started to kind of understand, okay, everywhere. I mean, I'm obviously generalizing, but places are different. Uh, yes. so yeah, I, I was surprised to hear that, that story from you just be like, to be fair, I have not spent, I think we went to, um, Chemnitz once and it was mm-hmm. nice that my, my husband's family is there, but I mean, we were kind of in and out. So I, ha- I just have no sense of the East at all. So it was interesting to hear that story. Yeah. You, you should visit the whole area. Um, the Saxony area. They have good wine if you like wine. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Totally off topic. Um, really? Yes. Okay. So, so um, fun fact, they do not really export their wine because they only produce in limited quantities. Okay. But it's so, so good. It's so good to the extent they have their own Christmas market with just Vincer Blue Vine. Really? Yes. Well, that's an incentive right there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that is a a fun fact that I didn't know. Um, Okay, obviously I've been to Leipzig and Berlin, but I'm not going to count that as East Germany. Um, Okay, so um, any other guidance you would give like aspiring business owners in Germany? Who are not Um, German? Why not German? I would say be brave. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't doubt yourself. Believe in your ideas. Um, There will be a lot a lot of naysayers, but you know your product best. Um, of course, it is important to take in feedback, suggestions, but don't ever let people, what uh, what people say, put you down. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people are just saying things they don't actually know. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I mean, you create your product, there's a reason why you create your product and you know your idea best. Um, the other thing would be networking. Mm. It's really important to find your support system, to find people you can really trust, to find people who are willing to spread words about your company yeah, without, without um, any hidden agenda, for example. It's, it helps a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, it helps save a lot of marketing costs, a lot of trouble and a lot of worries. And lastly, also to be sure to find out the right company structure for your venture. Oh yeah, what is your what is your structure? <laughs> <laughs> so, so did help with that at least. So that was a really long journey. Uh-huh. Um, at first, we wanted to start with a Uge. Uh-huh. The consultant said no. We should just go directly to a gay and beha. What? Yes. <laughs> Oh my yeah, god, okay. Yeah, big bad mistake. <laughs> Did you? We we went because we thought, oh okay, yeah, we, we, we got convinced because they said you're selling tea in order to protect yourself, you should mm-hmm. set up a game we have. But we after that we realized that a lot of tea vendors just have like OHR. What's uh, an which OHR? Is, which is a bigger an upgrade from Gabe Air. Yeah? Ah. Okay. Yeah, so um, uh, for GBR, I think you can't employ someone. But if you want to employ someone, you have to be a OHR. Okay, so it's like a partnership. Uh, so tell me if this, I have it right. So, and wait, it's a, 
OHA Air, OHR. Yeah, oh, yeah. OHR. So this is a Gabe Air, so a sole proprietor, a partnership of two sole proprietors, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. But unlike a Gabe Air, you can employ somebody. Yes. Or ha like one person, or is there like a seven? Like, is there a limit to the amount? <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but I know uh, if you need extra help, you have to upgrade to OMR. So. Okay. Oh, OHR, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's what you guys are now, an OHR. No. So, um, so now we are GBR because okay. we are not intending to hire someone. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it, and it costs us a lot just to switch back from G oh GmbH God. to GBR. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that sounds so painful. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, yeah you, it took us so much effort. I think it took us one year to switch back. Wow. I don't even yeah. want to think about the paperwork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, folks, in the show notes, you'll find a link to my guide of all these uh, services. Do you know there's all these services now that will, like, online do this for you? Mm -hmm. Like firma.de and stuff? So there are resources now that are not shady uh, that can help you. Um, yeah. I want to go back also, I know I'm like trying to wrap up here and not doing a good job, but, um, everybody, everybody that I'm interviewing networking always comes up as like the best thing for business. And I totally agree. So I want to just ask you, okay, you, you've started this, um, this group, this Southeast Asian entrepreneur uh, group, how else do you typically network? Um, so I, and many Asian, so I I'm cheap. <laughs> Let me be honest. I only go for free networking events. <laughs> Virtually, physically, I I just go attend what uh whatever relevant startup events that I can find as long mm -hmm. as it's free. Okay. Yeah. So so that's my criteria, and I I just put myself out there. I ask questions. I uh, offer help. Mm -hmm, to people mm -hmm. I meet uh, it's really important like how do you make good first impression you just offer help yeah you know mm -hmm. I know somebody who is doing similar things and all that mm -hmm. and that's how you start a topic at least that's how I start a topic sometimes okay and, yeah cool well can you tell people where they can find you and if you have any special events coming up uh, so they can find for Hungry Tea Masters on Instagram Mm -hmm. under the name Hungry Tea Masters mm -hmm. or on our website hungrytmasters.myshopify.com mm -hmm. we will be having a um, two tea pairing sessions one um, on 18th June at Lost Weekend in Munich 2.30pm mm -hmm. mm -hmm. a second one is a virtual event with our partner ITEI on 12th mm -hmm. August 3pm German time mm -hmm. um, more information will be posted on our social media account or website and our website um also if you are southeast asian entrepreneurs do join our network at uh seagroup.org we currently have certain event planned or in mind and uh, we are still in discussion on how best to bring it forward okay great well thanks so much for talking to me today laura and um everybody check out the links in the show notes yeah, thank you so much for the call. It's my pleasure. Thanks for listening. You can find this episode and all other episodes of the Germany Expat Business Show at my website at www.eleanormeyerhofer.com slash podcast. That's www.eleanormeyerhofer.com slash podcast. See you next time.